This is the Domain Magnet Show, where you'll learn everything you need to know about buying, optimizing, and selling online businesses with your host, Michael Baraslavsky. Hey, everybody. We're here today with Larry Ludwig. Larry Ludwig is you know, well-known in the SEO and affiliate marketing space, but we're going to talk to him today about acquisitions and selling businesses. So he's the CEO and founder at Ludwig Media, uh, but how he got to where he is now and, and the whole process along the way is really kind of interesting story. So Larry, why don't you just tell us a bit more about yourself, how you got started and, and what's on your plate at the moment? Sure. Um, thanks for having me. First of all, um, I, I just, the, the, I started in 1994. So I, I was really, I knew the, and actually even before that, I knew the web was really going to be changed with the whole idea of a web browser. So I, mm-hmm. I, at the school I was going to Clemson university I realized that the, you know, that was the future of the internet. And before, anything before that was just much more archaic. So I, I knew that things were changing, but unfortunately at the time, there was really no job opportunities in that space. It was more, tr- my background being computer science. So I, from that, I worked at a regular traditional company that was in uh, technology, but eventually in 1995, worked for a company who helped uh, develop some of the pioneering websites out there uh, called Poppy Tyson. And from that, just grew into building websites for a lot of Fortune 500 companies. And in 1999, decided to go off on my own and created a web hosting web development firm. And in 2009, this is really obviously a shortened version of my story. In 2009, yeah. decided to create a website called Investor Junkie, where I was kind of frustrated creating other sites for other clientele. Uh, their, their websites were growing, but you know, I was not getting or reaping any of the profits from those businesses and decided to create a business that was based on affiliate marketing. And the blog was called Investor Junkie. And in 2018, I sold that business for $6 million. Congratulations on the sale. You know, Investor Junkie is an interesting kind of model. And obviously, a lot of people who are familiar with affiliate marketing and content-based businesses in general, there is a ton of money in financial publishing. Uh, but it's hard. It's, it's harder to find quality writers. It's harder to mm-hmm. find the right audience that's actually going to purchase products that aren't complete scams and, and do well with those. So. I'd love to hear more about you know, what that process was like building up the business to the point when it was ready to be sold and then how you made that decision. Yeah, I mean, so in 2009, uh, yeah, I saw another blog was sold, Bankaholic, for I think $12 million in 2008. And that was pretty much a one-man show. And it was all based on affiliate marketing. So that was really based on uh, banking products and services. And yeah. I got the idea of why not create a blog myself that was – Really just on investing, because I, I saw a lot of other blogs out there on debt and debt services like credit cards, and it was a crowded market already in 2009, and figured why not do one on investing instead, and just right. not only that, but also had a, an actual interest in it as well, on top of, with my existing web hosting, web development background, worst case, I, I thought, use it as a showcase to showcase the capabilities of my firm, so we can scale this WordPress blog to be you know hundreds of thousands of visitors as opposed to uh, just, you know, not just talking to talk, but here's an actual living example that people can uh, mm-hmm. reference to. So with that said, yeah, there's really an issue with, I think part of it was just starting off the bat with a blog that was specifically on one niche and not going too general. A lot of my other friends in the space did personal finance or just getting out of debt. And I just didn't want to go down that path because again, I thought it was overplayed and decided to focus on one niche. And from that, just grew it from literally a zero audience to I think when I sold it last year, about 300,000 unique visitors a month. You know, from that was purely, I would say, 80% SEO-based, you know, search engine optimization. And the rest were really, I was starting to ramp up paid traffic as well. Interesting. And when you decided to ramp up the paid traffic, was that a, you know, a challenging process? Was it a big deviation from the normal process? Because many of the people that are watching or listening to this, they might have more experience with organic. They might have more experience with SEO. And the paid stuff we see is more with the lead gen and uh, the e-commerce guys. Well, in some ways, there is affiliate. I didn't know this existed until like maybe a few years ago. Affiliate marketing, there's there's a whole subculture of affiliate marketers that purely do paid traffic. It's really just a play on arbitrage. And I, you know, ironically, I kind of was shied away from that. I believed in adding value. You know, we added, we created these reviews that really helped the reader determine whether or not the service or this other service was appropriate for them and did comparisons and, and really created value add than more just pure copy. And to me, that was the the differentiator for our blog compared to other websites. With that said, yeah, I mean, SEO was still a primary traffic. It's for most, I think, blogs, most websites, SEO is a primary motivator of traffic where, you know, what has it been said? 50 to 80% of all traffic is search. So if you're not optimizing search, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. 
but it, you should diversify as well. And that was my biggest fear going to pay traffic. You know, I, I didn't want to rely on just one source or one channel of traffic because of about two years prior to selling, I was affected with a hit in Google. So I lost about 20 to 30% of my traffic. I, that was somewhat painful in the process because I lost about the same amount of revenue. And I didn't want to rely on just one, again, source or one channel. So I decided to focus on paid traffic as well. That's interesting. That's always bad news to wake up to. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible moment. Yeah. But when you got that back on track and you decided to look at paid traffic, how long was that before you decided, hey, it's time to look at selling this thing? Honestly, I was approached. So I never, I mean, when I built Investor Junkie, I knew I'd, I didn't want to tie it around my brand, my own personal identity, unlike what I'm doing now, ironically. I saw other bloggers and I have other friends who've sold their blogs. And honestly, for my end, I wouldn't want to buy those or acquire those blogs because it's so much tied in or ingrained into the author or, or a bunch of other writers. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make sure I had a, created a brand into itself. That's one of the things I definitely did differently compared to my uh, fellow bloggers in the personal finance space. And that was, so that was the first issue. The second is I was really approached by a company that was wanting to acquire me. It was not like I was actively pursuing and it just came down to the, the, you know, the numbers made sense and it just, I knew also in terms of growth of the company where I was generating the certain amount of affiliate revenue, I just couldn't grow it. I needed to change the company to be much different than what it was. So I had to be much more, say, course-based as opposed to just purely affiliate marketing. Where I knew, you know, I, I decided it made more sense to just sell it because of locking those gains and do something different. Sure. Okay. And, and that was, you know, as you said, it's a relatively recent deal. And I'd like to go back maybe a little bit further in time uh, to some other deals that you completed. And that was uh, through your empowering media acquisitions of hosted companies. And you, know, you mentioned something about how that actually took a different direction later. And I think that the audience might really appreciate some, some insight from that. Sure. Uh, and I'm trying to remember the date now. I think in 2000. I acquired a, a web hosting company. It was part of, it was not their entire company, but it was part of the company. And it was interesting. The one thing I got out of that was the, you know, what was said or what was promised in terms of customer base was a little different than what turned out to be reality. Meaning their accounting wasn't fraudulent, but it was not accurate in the sense of people were thought to be customers that weren't. Uh, people were paying different amounts than what they were said to be paid in the books. So there's definitely discrepancies that I had to deal with that I did not anticipate in the deal. So that's definitely one thing I learned in that deal that allowed me to you know, make sure not only if I want to acquire other future hosting companies in the, in the future, but also for actually selling investor junkie as well. So in other words, having my books in order, having the documentation and detail uh, that it was needed to be acquired as well for the selling of investor junkie made sense. Uh, so it was, a, it was definitely not what I anticipated. It was definitely a, a, a kludge of uh, dealing with different issues with the, the other company I acquired. But in the end, it, it wound up working out well. And, you know, I pretty much kept on to those customers until I shut down my business last year. And uh, what was the, the inspiration or the decision-making process to go ahead and close that one down after you'd kind of reconciled it and it was profitable? Um, well, I mean, Investor Chunky was sold 2018. So, again, it's, it's been now over a year after I sold it and decided that I want to do something different. Web hosting is really a, a difficult industry to be in. It's a commodity for the most part. It's hard to differentiate. It's 24-7 operation on top of that. In our case, we actually owned all the hardware and software. So a lot of other companies resell someone else's services. So it, it, right. it's a lot of work. And I just didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted to do, branch off and go off to something different in this case. Great. So you know, that's an interesting transition. And you, kind of, you got to sell those last year and, and obviously, or, or 2018 or whenever it was. And, and you 20. basically, 2018, right? So last year, I... We're, we're into the new one, you know how that'll be a mess up for the next month or two. But <laughs> as far as, uh, as what you're doing now, I mean, of course we want to learn about that too, because there are some people who are listening to this and they're thinking about selling their business rather than buying one, which about half of them probably, many people are buyers and sellers. So what was that kind of like where you say, all right, I don't have anything on my plate right now. Did you already have a big plan that you wanted to execute more thoroughly or were you kind of having one of those little mini retirement moments where you gradually got bored with being uh, um, yeah, I know what you're, yeah, I mean, as an entrepreneur, there's always something going on. I always have ideas going on in my head and there's, there's certain things obviously in the personal finance with my non I can't do at the moment. And I may do those after the non expires, but in terms of, I want to make sure I kept active. I don't believe in the, you know, to actually sit down and retire to some beach and drinking your pina colada. I don't, I don't think that's reality for most people, especially entrepreneurs. So with that said, 
I wanted to make sure, you know, I can help other fellow entrepreneurs in my case with their blogs. I think a lot of people don't either understand how to monetize or monetize effectively. And really, you know, with my background for many years now doing this, I think it can add value to other fellow entrepreneurs. Uh, that's really interesting too. So, you know, you've, you've got these skill sets you developed over the years from, from the web development, to the SEO and affiliate. When you get into affiliate marketing, obviously it seems pretty simple at first, but so much of it does come down to relationships and getting the best rates you can get. So if you had to grab, you know, the top three takeaways from the skill sets you've developed that you would like to convey to more of the fellow entrepreneurs you're working with, you know, what would those three be? In terms of affiliate marketing or even more broader than that? Uh, in terms of whether it's optimizing their revenue for the site. So I'd say monetization best okay. things you can do from monetization perspective and pairing your organic traffic with your offers or with the ads you're running, things like that. Yeah. Nature. I mean, the first and foremost, it's, I've always been about quality than quantity. I mean, you see many people determine, you know, I get X amount of visitors per month. And I don't think that's the right way to think of your traffic. I think it's making sure it's the right traffic. And I have used this example before. At one point on Investor Junkie, we had, um, what's called MLPs, Master Unlimited Partnerships. It's a type of investment. And unknowns to me, MLP can also mean My Little Pony. So I was getting a lot of traffic for something that was not appropriate, <laughs> for tweens that had nothing. So you get the idea that, again, these people are visiting right. this webpage thinking it's for My Little Pony, when in fact it's for Master Limited Partnerships. Again, not the right audience. So that's a right. great example of how you want to make sure you get quality over quantity. Right. Now, with that said, as an entrepreneur, you want to make sure you hit and that's one of the things we focused on and the merchants that we worked with always commented on that we always sent the best quality traffic to the right affiliate program. And that's something you should think about, be it you know, someone else's services or your own, is making sure you get the right leads and also understand where they are in the sales funnel. Be it SEO to pay traffic, they're all sales funnels. And I think most people lose sight of that fact that SEO is just another sales funnel. And where are they are on that journey? If they're at the beginning of their journey, Hitting them really hard for a sale is not going to do you any good if they're really just trying to understand who you are or, or maybe that you're not even the right solution. So you've got to make sure as they're compared to down the road where they're just ready to buy, like we did a lot of reviews that worked really well because of that's usually the last step before they're ready to convert. So you've got to understand that process. So that uh, there's two key, key takeaways. Outside of that, I guess I would say is really focusing on SEO if you're going to do that really understand that it's really, again, writing for the, the readers. I think gone are the days you can game Google and create, mm. you know, keyword stuff a keyword 10 times on the article and it will instantly rank for that, that keyword. Mm. Nowadays, it's much more about, you know, writing for the audience. And it's, I think, in much more alignment to the readers. You've got to make sure, again, not only where they are on the sales funnel and write that content appropriate for that, but understand you, 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 can, you can go too transactional for your content and Google will, not, will penalize you for that reason as well. You can understand you've got to write content for that reader. Gotcha. And, and where that reader's at at that time. And exactly. uh, what do you feel about the, the email marketing element or building communities so that you can keep that contact with that person throughout their journey and, and get your content sort of segmented and targeted and, and do that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm at least of the mindset that email is definitely critical. You should still use it. But I'm not of the mindset of the... the um, you know, you got to own the list and you, you control by having a mailing list, you own it. When in fact, you know, I make the comment of Google, still, you still have to deal with Google at that level because Google is the biggest email provider and you're dealing with, you know, I think what is 80% of the marketplace. If Google decides to put your email in the spam folder, it might as well just not be even delivered. So you have to be aware of, or even the tabs, which I've noted to be a 10% decrease in open rate. So you're still in the control of Google at some level with even email. That's not to say you shouldn't have an email list. You should most definitely. But I would also think multi, I'm more concerned with multi-channel. So you have a YouTube channel, an email, channel, you know, email list, a push notification, a SEO, a paid traffic, you know, social media. You have all these podcasts. You have the various channels. And these are the ways that people can get in touch with you. So you're not relying on Google, unlike I did, you know, initially rely on Google too much and saw the, the negative effects from that. So it definitely, you have to make sure you, you diversify your audience. Quick question back to the issue of, of the, the actual writing. Did you do all the writing yourself or did you have writers? Did you bring them in? Did you pay outsource writers? Uh, were there contributors? How'd you handle that? It, initially, it was just me. So I initially wrote the blog in 2009 until about 2012-ish. It was just me. 
And then after that, I hired an editor. So the, to make sure the quality of the content was up to snuff. And then started actually hiring uh, consultants to write articles on the site. One, because it just got too unwieldy. There was just too many articles I, I needed to be written. But also on top of that, it was just one of the things I, I started focusing on much more was updating the content. We, we wanted to make sure for a review or whatever it may be, people would read that article and understand it was updated as of the date of the whatever change they made to that service. Or let's say a rule change in regulations for a retirement plan. We want to make sure people came to the site and understood it was updated as of that date. And that took a lot of work. So we focused much more. In other words, there's only so much stuff you can talk about in the investment space. And I think that applies to pretty much any niche out there. And you really need to focus on keeping that content updated and current as opposed to you know, having a content that looks six months old. It just looks outdated for your readers and causes a poor experience. And Google also, I think, penalizes you for that reason as well. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And when you have that evolution of your business throughout and you bring in more people because you, you run into new challenges, um, what did that do to your skill sets you know, from the very beginning of your career until now? What do you think has been the most dramatic shift other than going from web development into affiliate stuff, maybe in the past five years, where have you really grown your skills? Much more understanding the, the sales funnel process, meaning the, really where people are on that journey and how it applies to paid traffic, SEO, you know, social media, email, and really getting the, you're creating that story and that narrative where they are and making sure, again, you're targeting that audience the right way. In other words, again, where they are in the, the, the sales funnel, you shouldn't, again, hit them hard for, and I use this example quite a bit, is what is a mortgage is much different intense than uh, what's the best mortgage rate. So in the case of what is a mortgage, you should be really educating the person on a mortgage as opposed to hitting them over the head with the best mortgage rates, which a lot of people I see do. And I think it's a classic mistake is people, you know, think that because of their wanting to find out information on something, you should also hit them over the head with other stuff. And what you should do is be linking, at minimum, linking to other articles on your site but not just purely doing a transaction or looking for a transaction. You should be educating and helping that person along the way. Yeah, no, that's so key. And you see a lot of kind of lower end blogs and lower quality sites that are out there and they're clearly spun up to make some cash. And, and that's a huge part of the industry. And there's nothing really wrong with that. People learning, they're already getting along the way toward their own, yeah. their own skill development, their own business development. But what are some of the other big mistakes you see? Because you're working with clients now, you're helping them get better at this. What are the, the big ones for someone's listening to this? They could just quickly go change it and it'll dramatically improve things. I would have to say the biggest issue I find is the lack of tracking. And one of the things I always focus on is attribution, is properly measuring, you know, the conversions, be it, again, in my case with affiliate products, but it, people don't do it their own products either. I mean, I, I find that fascinating that people will pay for traffic and then not know what the ROI. And they're just, you know, crossing their fingers and hoping that it works. And that's not, that's a recipe for failure. So I say that's probably the biggest issue I've seen is people just not properly measuring and seeing how well stuff converts. If you're not doing that, you don't know if it's, what you're doing is better or, or worse. And same thing can be applied to SEO. Same thing can be applied to anything you do. It's just measuring. Are you, are you improving every day or are you getting worse? And Google, you, it helps you at least convert that black box into something that's more clear. Okay, cool. That's something to, to really listen to, guys. If you know, you're watching this or listening to this and you don't have your tracking dialed in, not only are you leaving money on the table, opening yourself up to risk and, and everything that Larry has said, but you also make it harder for someone to buy your business uh, later on. So uh, in, in keeping that in mind, I'd like to sort of shift into a discussion of making connections, you know, your business development efforts and how you can connect with advertisers and leverage those relationships to optimize your site revenue, how you can connect with your affiliate managers and optimize your site revenue. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing I decided early on was having close relationships with the affiliate managers, without question, and eventually hired a person specifically for that purpose. All she did was literally work with every vendor that we had a relationship with, and even try to, of course, get other relationships as well. So she worked very closely with the various merchants and making sure that we, A, A they were happy, but also a B, you know, making sure we can say, hey, here's an idea that we can help better convert. Because if with affiliate marketing, unlike, say, traditional ad banners, once they leave your site, you're pretty much in the hands of the merchant to make sure he properly handled that customer to convert. And in some cases, people do, on their side, the classic mistakes of, like, sending them to a home page, having a poor landing page, um, you know, lack of tracking on their side as well. Well, just the issues that just come along with anything in any type of marketing campaign. 
So therefore, you've got to make sure you really work closely with these vendors. In some cases, they got it. In some cases, they don't. I mean, that's a classic issue. So with, without a question, making sure you have a close relationship with them and understanding what their needs are and, and making sure you, in the end, your, your product, in, the, in our case, the reviews that we had, the comparisons were accurate. That was one of the things we always told to the, the uh, merchants. In the end, they couldn't determine whether we gave a positive or negative review. But in the end, if there's any issues with the review in terms of features and functionality that was missing or not accurate, by all means, we were like, tell us, you know, if you're introducing a new feature, tell us immediately. You know, don't leave us hanging where we have to go out and figure out, hey, you added this new feature three months ago. Well, why didn't you tell us this? You know, in some cases, some merchants got that. And in some cases, we had to figure out on our own, oh, yeah, they added this new feature. We got to update our review to make sure that includes that, that documentation. Yeah, that makes sense. So and when you've got these issues too, and you go and you get your, your various deals struck and you're able to get better rates, better commission rates, it might be awesome uh, in a way, but you have to also maintain the integrity, uh, the integrity of your content, the integrity of your messaging. And as you mentioned earlier, there's so many personal finance and investment directed blogs uh, or content sources online, which are really they're not writing so much for the reader, they're writing to the affiliate program that offers the best commission. I think the readers get that too. I think they see right through that nowadays. And I think that hurts ultimately their brand. I mean, you're, if you're trying to create a brand for longevity and not purely just a, a short-term game for income, you've got to go down that path. You've got to be ultimately for your readers. In the end, that's ultimately who's paying for the uh, traffic for your site. And you also have to make sure everyone's happy. I mean, what I kind of dissuaded was sending the, the a certain visitor to the wrong service. Our goal is ultimately to make sure this person went to the right service that was right for them. And everyone in the end was happy. I was happy. Uh, our company was happy. The, the merchant that we worked with was happy. And the person that you know, signed up for that said service was happy. And then everyone benefited. So we, we wanted to make sure everyone was happy in that process. That's a great point to visualize the full life cycle of where that dollar comes from that you ultimately get paid. It does start with the customer. Even if you're an affiliate, even if you're running it, um, you have ads on your site, the money ultimately needs to come in your mind from that person that you're serving with your information. Most definitely. Where do you think that shift really started to happen in the personal finance and investment niche, but also more broadly, um, you know, kind of online content. There was a lot of, I want to say between 2005 and 2010, there was a lot of garbage out there that people hadn't quite caught on to yet. Yeah. Um, when did it start? I mean, I don't, I think, when some of the blogs started selling for seven figures, I think is when people realized, hey, this is a real business. And it's not just a little hobby. You can make a few thousand dollars off of it. So I, I think right. when people started realizing that, I think really started to grow the idea of, hey, um, you know, one is you, you, this can be a long game. You can do very well at it. But also making sure that you're not, like you said, not just purely doing it for a short-term play for your know, income. Again, a lot of people have done that and have disappeared mm-hmm. in the process. I mean, I've known... Or, and I've seen many bloggers who have burnt out after a few years of doing this. And, you know, mm-hmm. needless to say, I was around for 10 years before I sold. So, and I've, I've quite a few other friends have been around the same period. It's because of they, that longevity. They understand, you know, the short-term pain perhaps of maybe decreasing your income. It's a long-term game of just being around, you know, to survive and, and thrive in the end. Where, uh, again, someone who's doing it just purely for revenue will get hurt. I think we'll wind up hurting their brand and hurting their reputation and disappearing very quickly because people see right through that. Absolutely. And that has been um, so accelerated now with how much everything is, is easily accessible, information about people. Um, it's, it's not as easy to put up. Well, yeah. let me take that back. It's just as easy to put up a site with a fake picture and a fake name and, and, and do that sort of and say it's a pseudonym and it's okay. But there's also a, a much greater appreciation now of people who are willing to put their name and their face out there uh, just because of how much scamming did happen in the past and the internet marketing world got a really bad really bad name but functionally yeah. digital marketing is almost the only marketing these days everything's well, integrated yes exactly i mean the, the interesting thing i found out is i initially traded investor junkie without my name on it i was anonymous in fact and around 2012 around that same period i decided to uh, you know make sure it was branded as my you know i was part of the company because of i want to make sure again we're we're legitimate and again legitimizes that you're not some no name even advice on various products and services that you want to at least give a background but without question i mean that goes also to google as well i mean ironically google aligns all that stuff now even more so than previously where the whole idea of eat eat you know in google's algorithm you know, making sure you have that expertise authority and trust 
you know, part of it is just by having your name on the site. And actually, I've consulted a few clients where they have nothing on there. They're just an anonymous blob of a brand, but they have no author name, which this is bizarre because if you want to have that, you, it adds credibility not only to the readers, you know, a non-SEO uh, idea, but from even from Google as well nowadays. It, they're very much in alignment, which is great for, for your perspective because you can, it's, one, it's harder for others to gain SEO, but also from your end, it, 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 if you're an authority in the said space, you can easily rank for content where before it was you, again, you had to play these stupid tricks. Right. That's a troubling and frustrating balancing act. If you're going to sell it, I'm sure, you know, there's a way to handle my brand is associated with this as an individual, but my brand is not the entire business. And so yeah. that's something where we at domain magnet have acquired some where, yeah, there's a, a very clear author that the readers are familiar with and it's a real person, the seller, but it's, relatively easy to make the transition it's a process and we, we get better at it every every time we do it but it is a little bit daunting versus someone whose whose whole business is wrapped around who they are which is that's a tough sell so yeah i mean i i have a few friends who have sold their blogs and one of them um you know get rich slowly jd roth is the author mm. and he was very well known in the space he was geez he started i think 2004 blogging even and right. only started monetizing, I think, in around 2007. And he sold it to Quinn Street in 2009, I want to say, 2010, I believe. And again, it was so tied to him. And he actually stayed on board for a few years. And ultimately, he bought it back in 2016, I want to say. He didn't disclose the amount right. he bought it back. But I'm sure it's pennies on the dollar from what it originally was sold for. And in the end, he's, of course, happy with it because he owns that blog and has all that content again. But mm. again, I can't imagine buying someone's who's so much tied into that brand that it just doesn't make sense. You want to, if you were looking to acquire a website or a blog, you should have, it should be a brand into itself, at least at some level that the person who created or founded it be removed out of it and someone else can be inserted in with maybe not no difference in quality, but it, it's not discernible to the average reader where maybe someone who's a really highly engaged, highly uh, you know, big fan of that blog or the website will notice, but the average person won't. And, but most of, in a personal finance space, it's the exact opposite. Usually the, the personal finance person is the expert, the, is the authority. And so ingrained into that blog, it's very hard to remove that person. So you know, some of the companies like your web pals who acquired me have had a difficult time finding blogs that meet that criteria because of that exact reason. Right. It's a challenge. And it's, it's an important one to deal with. If you're, if you're right now, you're a buyer or you're going to sell at some point, just being aware of strategies you can use to make that go well. There are cases where, as Larry's saying here, most readers won't notice. They're not necessarily super engaged or attached to the personality. There are other cases where it's a larger business and you want to have a, you know, kind of PR friendly way of saying, this is a great thing for what this project is and what we're trying to do for you, the reader or the customer. We're now going to be able to do it even better because we've been acquired and this is what's happening with the founder and yada yada and turn it into a positive because generally people that do have some brand loyalty don't like to wake up one day to find out that yeah. some faceless corporate entity or private equity firm is now uh, running the show and they might just stop reading. So now for you, uh, you don't want any more hosting business in your life and, and you got to not compete in the personal finance kind of space. So financial publishing, maybe in general, if you were to go buy a business tomorrow, hypothetically, what would it be? Yeah, I've been looking for acquiring. Again, you, you have the gears always running in the back of your head uh, with the entrepreneurial spirit. And I guess I've been looking for other niches outside of personal finance, of course. And I've, there's been a few I've been looked at. The problem is the multiples I've seen are just too, way too high. Or, or their, their demands, their the amount of traffic they get, the amount of revenue they generate, and then the multiple they're asking for is just crazy. And I just can't see myself acquiring some of them. So, so far, I have not found any one out there. Uh, but I've been looking at various niches really completely different from the personal finance. Like uh, one of them was an auto blog. Uh, another one was, um, what was the other one? It was in furniture. And I, I, from my end, just, again, the issues came down to more multiples. And, you know, but their opportunity was there. I think they were under, I think most blogs or most, finance, most sites in general are under monetized or not monetized well enough. And it, again, goes back to the quality over quantity. What matters is how well you're monetizing, not how much blog visitors you get per month. And I think people still lose sight of that fact. So I always look at opportunities in this space as the ones that are, you, you see are not a really well-designed site. You see 
they're generating income on a regular basis and maybe have some loyal fan base. But they're just not, you can see opportunities for upsells or downsells or other ways to monetize, say, through affiliate for that matter, if they actually have their own products and services that you just didn't think about in the end. And that's really, you, you create a better relationship with that customer is my goal. Uh, so, but right now I have not found any blog or website interested in acquiring just yet. Oh, hopefully. <laughs> well, hopefully uh, our, our audience doesn't inundate you with emails offering uh, uh -oh. <laughs> things you don't want. But well, <laughs> yeah. at the end, when we, when we ask how they can get in contact with you, maybe you'll be careful. <laughs> but, um, I mean, uh, yeah, for my, I'm fine with that. I, honestly, if, if yeah. it's a good offer, I'm interested. Good, good. So that actually, you know, it, it brings to mind the idea of the multiples. And we, we also struggle with this. On the buy side, operating in a sort of micro private equity capacity, our, our view of the multiples that are going around right now is a little bit sour. Like, all right, we've got to find more motivated sellers. We have to go more off market. We can't just do things the way it was easier a few years ago. But on the brokerage side, we do some brokerage. I do, Michael does, and we are involved with other brokerage efforts. That's a, you could say it's to their credit. You know, the brokerages have really professionalized over the past five years. They're able to get higher prices. They're able to build these big buyer lists and, mm -hmm. and do proper due diligence and marketing for those opportunities. Where do you think that is going to get to be uncomfortable? Because for you, you're saying these, these multiples are a bit ridiculous. What is the comfortable multiple for, for your risk tolerance? And, and do you think that we're going too far now towards a 36, 48 months, you know, beyond that? Um, that's a good question. I guess, I mean, like anything, the mar whatever the market bears and what other people are yeah. buying doesn't mean necessarily, like, and I look at it no different, hence my background with investing, it's no different than investing in the stock market. It, you know, just because of the multiples are out there doesn't mean it's a good deal. And there are cases like WeWork being a classic example that happened a few months ago and, and before it went public. And just the multiples they were asking for and how they were evaluated at just didn't make sense. It was just ludicrous, the numbers they were asking. And it's the same thing. It can be the same thing with and smaller markets like we're dealing here with blogs you know, with affiliate marketing or, or otherwise, or, you know, even Amazon stores. We I mean, have seen many Amazon stores asking multiples that are just insane for just the Amazon store, no actual physical storefront or blog or, or separate website for that matter. I just find that bizarre as well because you're relying on one channel. I mean, as, a, as a, a person buying those type of sites, I would look at it as an opportunity to maybe, again, they're under monetized. So, I, I mean, to your point, I don't know if there's a right answer or wrong answer to this question. I guess it really depends. Re one, it really depends on the, the niche or, or business it's in. And the other is, you know, what opportunities do you see to grow that business? I mean, if it's fully maxed out, well, uh, then it's purely an income play for you. And then you should be expecting a certain multiple, whatever that may be. If it's below, if it's under monetized, then you, should, you know, even though they might be paying a high or asking for a high multiple, you see huge opportunities for growth. You're, in the end, you're, you're still coming out ahead. So I don't see any disadvantage for a high multiple. It's just a matter of what opportunities you see to increase that, you know, that revenue, the top one. Right. And on the buy side, you know, that is going to differ from team to team or, or individual who has different kinds of skills and connections. And so the, what multiple you're willing to pay, again, it's going to vary, as, as Larry says. But uh, on the sell side, if you are looking to sell your, your business and you've got a number of things that need doing still, and you know that it's really not fully, fully maximized, then knowing that there are actually quite a few opportunities on the market for people, you have to be realistic um, and you definitely have to find ways of increasing your competitive moat, so to speak, because the barriers to entry for online businesses are so low and the risks of them disappearing overnight are so high that you don't typically get the same kind of businesses you get. Well, for instance, you, you mentioned a publicly or now publicly traded company, but uh, some of these venture backed startups and the ideas of what multiple could be gotten later, that is just not really applicable here. So yeah. it's a funny, funny little balance that we're working with, but I find it interesting. We always have to evaluate that. What can we do? What's too high? How do we know this is a great deal? And we turn down a lot of good deals. I mean, people who are listening to this right now may have actually tried to sell something to us. And it's not that it wasn't good business, it's just that we knew the opportunity cost of not going with others was, was not acceptable. It's the classic Warren Buffett statement. You know, you can go to the uh, at bat and you don't have to swing whenever you want to and not be called, you know, called out. You, it's the ultimate, you, you decide, you know, if you have the money, you can swing whenever you want. You don't have to swing at every pitch that's thrown to you. 
And right. you know, I think the people who side of that, like, I think a lot, I mean, again, there are some companies that they're venture capital based and want to have a, a huge acquisition and they, they're forced to, you know, a certain amount of acquisitions per quarter or per year. And I think that's mm -hmm. for a small business owner like myself, you're not playing that game. You're, you're ultimately, it's your money. You decide which is the you know, best fit. And it depends on where you want to allocate it. Does it make sense to put it in things like the stock market or other investments? I mean, it's, you're always comparing your investments to other, other opportunities out there. So it's an opportunity cost. So from, from your end, you don't have to put it into a company. You could put it into a CD if you want to. I mean, as, as boring as that sounds, but you know, <laughs> what other opportunities are out there? It's, it's a matter of if the multiples are too high, you can just sit and wait. Right. These adjustments, they, they happen in kind of these leaps and then, and then you've got a little bit of mm -hmm. this, is, this is the standard, this is the industry standard and then a big leap again. Yep. And I think that that has to do with the cycles of digital marketing and global commerce in general. So when I was working, I previously worked at Flippa as a account manager. And there was a six month period where it seemed like every single lead that came in, someone that wanted to list and deal with an account manager was a Shopify drop shipping store. It was running <laughs> Facebook ads to a one or two products were inundated with them. Yeah, they sell, but just the expectations were sometimes way off. So when there's a flood of them, obviously that shifted. So Amazon's doing oh, the yeah. same thing right now. The FBA stuff is all over the place. And yep. it, what's interesting with FBA is that people are more, reliably able to get something that looks like a very substantial business if they run it for a few years. It doesn't look as easily replaced and, and copied as a, as a Shopify store, although it pretty much is, but it has a certain air of this is more legitimate. I'm not certain exactly why that is, but yeah. that has been the way it was. I mean, yeah. from my end, you're still relying on one channel. If Amazon decides to sell or undercut your price, you're kind of screwed. And you're, mm -hmm. again, you're relying on just one source of traffic. So from my end, that's, I think, a recipe for disaster. No different than relying on Google for SEO only. Right. And I actually have a very good friend who works in she's operations and accounting, or excuse me, marketing head for a, they actually have their warehouse. They don't use third-party logistics, and they have a pretty substantial amount of products and SKUs, I think 65,000. It's a pretty massive operation, but a small team that does it. And they're able to, because of, things like Amazon um, and things like Sears and Walmart and all these other channels they use. And they use a company they call Channel Advisor to help them manage all that since it's gotten out of hand. But when you look at buying a business, it's like Amazon FBA business, it is also really important to say, well, wait a minute, are they just on Amazon? Is it just this one traffic source and the risk that Larry's talking about? Or do they also have their listings on Sears, Walmart, new egg, whatever it is, they're selling the appropriate sort of sub niche marketplaces. Yep. It's a hassle. It's more of a hassle for you as the buyer, but if they have a team in place and a larger one will, that's a real business that's going to be around for a while and not something that was created because someone bought a course, did it, and now they bought a new course and they want to go do that other thing. Nothing wrong with it, but different multiples, different profile, exactly. different risks. It goes back to the multiple issue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I want to get your kind of um, prophetic insight into what you think in the next five, 10 years, where are things going? You've talked a lot about Google really kind of doing some good things, really and catering to the, to the quality for the user, the end reader. It's not all rosy with Google. Yeah. Right. So let's hear what you, what you think is coming next. I actually wrote an article recently on my own website, LarryLittlewood.com about this. So I, I wrote actually, what is it? Nine I said, yeah, eight blogging trends for the next 10 years. One of the big ones was the less organic search without question. If you really just compare the stats from 2014 to now, it was a 8% decrease. So people mm. are getting less click through rates through Google and that's only, you know, past eight years or so. And that's a huge difference. So you've got to make sure, um, and that's just the number one position, no less. I mean, keep in mind, it gets wor dramatically worse right. once you go past number one. Um, uh, so that's a, that's a big issue you, because Google wants to keep people obviously on their site and I, I can't blame them. So that means you're, I mean, in the end, people must think of SEO, social media, what have you, you're still, you're renting that traffic. You're not, you don't own it. You know, a mailing list you do own to a degree, but the problem is getting delivery. But with that said, you've got to think of it as you're just renting this traffic. You've got to treat it as such. And that right. means you've got to do other ways to get people to your site, be it through podcast, YouTube video channel, um, you know, paid traffic, social media, what have you. You've got to look at other channels. You can't just rely on just one channel no matter what your business is. I mean, I, th I think it's the biggest issue. People lose sight of that. I've seen so many businesses go out of business because of they had this, you know, the uh, Instagram, I think I forget the name of the business, 
but they were relying on Instagram for all their traffic. Instagram instantly changed their algorithms, and the next day they were out of business. And it's, it's a shame, but that's people rely on things you can't control. So that's always, I think, the number one issue. And it's, I mean, obviously, coming from me who was affiliate marketing, you know, obviously I can't control those products and services. And I knew that was, you know, one of the reasons I can't say ultimately I sold, but it was, I locked in those gains. I, I looked at, it was just relying on too much. I, eventually I knew in order to get to the next level of income, I had to be a much different company. And I knew I had to have my own products and services. I knew I, I, knew I had to have courses. But at the time the offer came down and it was, the offer was right. So I decided to sell and lock in those gains. Um, so that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Right? And next, I think the biggest thing that I've found fascinating in the past 25 years of being in this industry is the idea of, we've taken for granted of all free content. And, you know, mm-hmm. honestly, people have been monetized. They're considered, they are the product in the sense of, you know, with these ad banners or affiliate, really more ad banners than affiliate marketing. But people are right. the product and you're being marketed to by targeted ads. And I think we're going to see more gated content, more content behind a firewall or paywall, if you will, than we've seen previously. I mean, even, you know, look at the Wall Street Journal has been very successful at it, or New York Times now has actually been very successful at it. And even you look at things like Disney Plus, where you're kind of eliminating that middleman, the, the whole idea of having going to a movie theater or, you know, getting to, you know, purchase a CD at Walmart. That's all been eliminated literally overnight. Now Disney is going directly to the consumer at a flat rate per month behind a paywall. And that to me is the future of everyone's content for the most part. I mean, you have to drive away some free content out there to entice the reader to, you know, engage in your site and be interested to eventually pay for something. I think we're going to see much more gone of the way of just relying on advertising as a revenue model. I think it's just one is people are getting sick and tired of seeing ad banners and all these pop-ups and hence they're putting more ad blockers on their browsers. But I think also yeah. it's just becoming less and less effective. Yeah, yeah. And when you're going forward in the next five years, if you're running a site, something to think about is, okay, this idea, you know, what you're describing is kind of coinciding with the, the death of truth that some people have been decrying. Mm-hmm. Like the 21st century is so hard to know what's true because there's so much information and something can be 99% true, 1% BS, and you'll repeat the BS because it came with the full yep. plate of truth. Yep. And it spreads virally. And there may be now a point at which people are realizing, hey, the content I pay for, I can trust much more than content that's free. Yep. I mean, it's, sort of, it's also another uh, trend I see as well is the whole idea of um, deep fake. You know, I talk about in my uh, blog post here, uh, personal mm-hmm. brands. I think personal brands are becoming even more important and more critical in the next 10 years. That's not to say, I mean, I've, ironically, I've, I've created or transitioning more to my own personal brand. And, but in the same notion, too, it's going to become more scalable than ever with the idea of deep fake. If you look mm-hmm. at things like your video and audio, you can easily replicate, you know, someone like myself, even though I'm an actual physical person, you can turn into right. a whole like max headroom style type of automation where they can literally spew out videos and you know, podcasts and you would never be the mm-hmm. wiser. It's actually a computer doing it instead. And that's, I think, the trend we're going to see in the next 10 years is you'll be able to create a personal brand that's scalable, you know, infinitely compared to what you were only limited by your own personal time and availability. So I think it's going to be a fascinating change that not only to your point, it's going to be harder to determine whether it's real or fake. In the end, if you're a personal brand, it won't matter as long as it's trustworthy that that brand, mm-hmm. again, even if it's done by a computer, ultimately they respect and trust that brand because of it's been said by that brand. Gotcha. And so it's, it's personalized. It's a, it's a human type entity that they, that they're receiving the information from, but ultimately it, it doesn't need to be. And in fact, in China, they've rolled out, I think a male and a female algorithmically generated, um, essentially a deep fake type of newscaster. Yep. It's a very fascinating movement and people are apparently comfortable with that. And we don't have any problem watching uh, cinematic in a, in a video game and appreciating that. So we're really just that little bit of uncanny valley uh, being bridged now. Yeah, I mean, hmm. I, I have an example on my own website from Joe Rogan, the podcaster. Hmm. And oh, it's, yeah. all, it's all deep fake. You cannot tell the difference. It's, Joe, it's not Joe Rogan speaking this podcast. It's just amazing. Right. So you, you have to think in those terms for your own site. I mean, the technology is becoming, it's going to become so cheap, be easily available. You can easily do it yourself and, you know, use it to your own advantage for your own business. So I, by all means, I think that's one of the things you got to keep aware of is the idea of people do want a shortcut. They want to, you know, just tell me the answer. Don't make me think. They want someone to tell them, here's what you should do. 
And then therefore, personal brands can become even more important than before. And you have shifted to your personal brand. And so I'd like to take a moment and talk about you know, what's next for you, LarryLudwig.com, the, the way that you're approaching teaching people and helping them kind of get to where some of the points that you've been at. What else, what else is in it for you? And, and what are you hoping to do in the next few years? I mean, I, like I said, I think there's a huge opportunity in education. And I think there's a huge opportunity to help other you know, fellow entrepreneurs uh, effectively market and promote their brands. And mm -hmm. so I've been working on doing consulting and creating courses to help fellow entrepreneurs. Great. And, you know, for those who are listening or watching and they think you seem like you really know what you're talking about and they would like to work with you or, or at least learn more about what you're up to and check out some of those articles, you know, there's LarryLudwig.com, L-U-D-W-I-G. We'll have a link. Um, but let us know, is there anywhere else that they should get in touch with you, something more direct? And uh, if there's anything else that you would like to kind of announce right now that, that maybe they'd be interested in. Um, yeah, actually two things. So I have, a, if you go to LarryLudwood.com slash podcast, I have a uh, sign up for my mailing list and you can actually get a uh, guide on affiliate marketing, the things you should avoid in affiliate marketing. So I think that'll be helpful for some of the audience. Outside of that, I'm working on a course on, if you sign up for my mailing list, I haven't released it yet, but I'm working on a course on uh, full-time bloggers. So helping people become from, unfortunately, a lot of people are part-time and really not generate much revenue from their, their websites. My goal is right. to help people become full-time at it. You know, I think a lot of people aspire when they first go down this entrepreneur path, if they're, they're doing, they may be monetizing at some level, but they're not really fully utilizing the capabilities of what can be done on the web. And my goal is that with the course to help them. Yeah. And it can be really helpful when you're doing these kinds of things to have somebody who has the outside perspective. And because we know you're sitting there, well, I should do this and I should do that. And these are ways I could probably squeeze a little more money out of this. And I'm leaving money on on the table over there, but which one do I do first? And, and which one's gonna give me the most impact? Um, so having that well, outside view that has been there and done that is helpful. Not only that, but it's the, I'm not, you know, I, I don't recommend doing the whole pushy sales either. It's a matter of you mm. know, promoting or, or discussing something at the right time. You know, there's a right moment for everything. Again, going back to what is a mortgage, pushing someone for the best mortgage rate is really not the right time for it. You have to understand there's, there's a buildup you have to do. You can't just instantly, you know, buy my stuff. You can't, it just doesn't work that way. I think a lot of people right. lose that, lose sight of that fact. So. Yeah. Well, unless you're standing outside selling a beer in 95 degree weather, then pretty much <laughs> you're going to have to build a relationship. Exactly. So um, LarryLudwig.com slash podcast, get on the mailing list, check out the podcast, you know, check out the, the upcoming course. And if there's anything else that, that the, uh, that they need, can they reach you on LinkedIn or email? The easiest way is just go to LarryLidwood.com. I have a contact form on the bottom of the page. I mean, perfect. The, I hate giving out, like, here's my Twitter account, my Facebook, here's, you know, the five different ways. No, just go to LarryLidwood.com. It's just easy enough that way. Yeah, all the channels are there. All right, thank you so much, Larry. Everybody, uh, you know, it's been great to chat with Larry Ludwig. If you want to work with him, go check out LarryLudwig.com. If you don't want to work with him yet, check out the podcast anyway. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Domain Magnet is a leader in buying and selling online businesses with a proven track record of expertise gained from over 300 deals since 2004. To learn more about how we can help you acquire or exit a profitable online business today, head over to DomainMagnet.com for more details.